Welcome everyone to Straight Science. Straight Science is a UAF evening seminar series put on by Northwest Campus here in Nome and University of Alaska Fairbanks, UAF, Alaska Sea Grant, also here in Nome. And tonight you're in the, in the home office. And both Northwest Campus and Alaska Sea Grant, we are public servants of the Bering Strait region. We serve all peoples. And the Bering Strait region is the homeland and waters of the Inupiaq, Central Yupik, and St. Lawrence Island Yupik peoples. Now tonight, um, there's been a lot of interest in this, this evening's presentation. I don't see a lot of people on from outside the region, but, um, and in some ways that's that gives more um, opportunity for the people of this region to have interactions with tonight's speaker, Franz Muter, and the topic of subarctic and Arctic fisheries. And I think we'll hold questions unless they're burning questions, we'll hold off until the end of his presentation. Franz Muter is no stranger to straight science. He's given straight science on his work on Arctic Cod in 2020. It was actually the night that we shut school down for the pandemic, it was very exciting. There was, uh, he's also talked about his work on Skuliak in 2019 and about fisheries management in this part of the world in 2018. So tonight he's gonna be talking about uh, subarctic and Arctic marine fisheries. And Franz is the one to do it. He is with the University of Alaska Fairbanks College of Fisheries and Ocean Sciences in Juneau. Trick question. Yes, there is a CFOS uh, branch in Juneau. And um, uh, he is also, he serves on the North Pacific Fisheries Management Council's Science and Statistical Committee. And what is the Science and Statistical Committee? They are the ones, they advise, they look through and advise on all the scientific analyses relevant to fish management. So Franz is a perfect speaker to talk about the science, the science portion of the fisheries. So with that, Franz in Juno on our same time zone, and no stranger to the Bering Strait region and no stranger to straight science. Take it away. We are so glad to have you tonight. Well, thank you for that introduction and good evening, everyone. And thanks for sacrificing your dinner time. Hopefully you have dinner handy. Um, I just had mine. Uh, yeah, Gay had asked me to talk about sort of the future fisheries in the Arctic. And so I added the subtitle here through the looking glass because sometimes it feels like we find ourselves in a slightly bizarre and unfamiliar situation today with all the changes going on. Um, so I don't really have to talk too much about um, the basic underlying changes, but I'll, I'll, I'll kick it off with a little bit of an overview of uh, you know some of the recent changes that we probably all know about. But for context, <clears throat> um, I thought I'd show this um, fishery footprint that's slightly outdated now from 2016 um, of all the, the yellow highlighted areas are where commercial fisheries occur. And as you can see, these large commercial fisheries, many of them occur kind of on the doorsteps to the Arctic, in particular, these inflow shelves, the two main inflow shelves, the Barren Sea and the Bering Sea, Bering Chukchi Sea through Bering Strait. And so really they kind of poise to move north if um, if fish move north, when fish move north. And so just a little bit of an overview of what we know in terms of borealization of Arctic gateways that may um, that may move our fisheries around. Um, uh, just, uh, you know, we all know there have been reductions in sea ice warming and uh, northward and associated northward expansion of uh, southern or boreal plankton and fish. Um, so I thought I'd start with just a, a quick general overview of sort of um, temperatures in the region. Um, and this is for the southeastern part of the Bering Sea Shelf based on these um, 
uh, global ERS uh, uh, reconstructed sea surface temperatures. And I just um, showing them here by month from January through December um, through January 2024. And so these are anomalies for each month, uh, the anomalies from the long-term average. And um, what really, whoops, what really stands out is, um, get my pointer here, is this most recent super warm region. Uh, um, and then at the bottom here, I just took the average of the June through September temperatures. And clearly that um, time period here stands out um, as having way higher temperatures surface temperatures than, um, than earlier in the record. And then I pulled out the data for the uh, just the northern part of the Bering Sea here. Um, again, the same monthly anomalies. This looks a little funky now because these are relative to the long-term average. And because the January through April period used to be generally ice covered, um, the long-term average is pretty close to um, um, uh, you know, minus 1.8 degrees really. Um, and so this shows the, the warmer, the years that have had less ice and warmer temperatures. And clearly, again, you can see in the recent period here where the ice disappeared in the, in the winter, um, winter month, and you have these, uh, much warmer temperatures, um, than usual. And that same, period it certainly was very warm in the northern Bering Sea as well. Um, I summarized two time periods here, the June through September time period, um, and we had this early 2000s warm period, and then this more recent warm period, um, even uh, even warmer than that. But what really stands out is the, that winter time period when generally it's um, uh, the, you know close to minus 1.8 degrees, when there's ice and uh, a few times in the past, in the late 70s, uh, early 2000s, there have been some blips of uh, less ice and um, and actually warmer ocean temperatures um, in, in that area. But really that um, late period here uh, stands out quite dramatically in terms of, um, relatively speaking, much warmer temperatures um, than in uh, any, any earlier time period in that area. And that's, of course, been associated with a bunch of fish moving into that area. And here's just one that you've probably all seen, just um, Pacific cod distribution in a you know more typical year as we had in 2010, when they you know they tend to avoid the cold pool. And as that cold pool disappeared, they spread out into the or moved into the northern Bering Sea all the way up to the um, Bering Strait here. Um, I like to look at it this way, and some of you have probably seen this too. Um, just uh, to show the uh, what historically was this really sharp drop off in fish density. If you look at the number of fish or biomass of fish, I should say, per unit area, um, the high, very high biomass here in the southern part of the region. So that's along this blue line, essentially at each latitudinal band, looking at the average fish density. So down here is where um, uh, in this area is where most of the large commercial fisheries have occurred, um, which is where historically, you know, the high biomass was, this is all fish species combined, basically just the total fish biomass. And then a very sharp drop off and very low biomass of, um, of fish as you get to Bering Strait and then into the Chukchi Sea. And this is from the 2010 through 2012 time period when we had surveys in the Chukchi Sea. Um, and then that changed very dramatically in 2018-19 uh, um, when this the density of fish was kind of uniform across the entire Bering Sea shell from the Aleutians down here to all the way up to Bering Strait pretty much. There's a very high density compared to um, earlier time periods of fish in the Northern Bering Sea. Um, so uh, this really reflected a massive redistribution of sort of the biomass of fish from the Southern part towards the Northern Bering Sea all the way up to Bering Strait. We don't have any sampling in that during that time period further north. So we don't really know what that looks looked like further north, but probably not nearly as high as it was uh, right uh, right south of Bering Strait. 
Um, and so that had all kinds of impacts on the broader ecosystem. Um, um, and uh, I mean, first of all, there were some some bottom effects during that time period associated with those warm temperatures. Um, there were uh, uh, re decreasing trends in chlorophyll A that we know from some of the satellite data, and that was very low in 2023, kind of unusually low. Um, that might suggest a lower productivity in the system. Um, there were, during those warm years, very low abundances of important prey species, and those are the large copepods and euphausids that are important food for fish. Um, they were very low during the warm years. Um, and even in 2023, they are not uh, were not recovering yet in in that cooler year. Um, but you might expect a lag there because they probably take a while to build up in in biomass, so they might well increase in the in the short term. Um, of course, we also had all kinds of top down effects because of that massive biomass of fish in the northern Bering Sea, and we can clearly see a decline in uh, some benthic invertebrates and small fish in the northern Bering Sea that followed that large increase in abundance of the larger fish predators like Pacific cod or pollock. And then, you know, sort of some combined effects of that. Um, there was overall probably a reduced productivity during that time period and competition for prey during um, warm years that reverberated throughout the entire system. And of course, we saw the seabird die-offs and also um, at least a temporary drop-off in body condition of some fish, although that was kind of variable over that time period. Um, in, in the most recent year, uh, 23, we saw some signs of recovery maybe from that um, earlier um, heat wave, and notably in the seabirds they were doing a lot better last year and um, fish conditions kind of a mixed bag. Um, so all in all, this warming period um, may have been associated with uh, reduced carrying capacity, but we really don't have a good handle on that right now. We really don't have a good way to um, estimate sort of the overall carrying capacity in that system. Um, then, uh, so those are kind of changes related to distribution, um, and uh, they, these distributional shifts, of course, are also associated with changes in the types of species that you see at a given location. And so this next section, I'm just going to focus a little bit on changes in uh, diversity or species richness. Um, and I'll look um, both in the, the Arctic overall, um, and then uh, particularly also in the Chukchi Sea. Um, so this is from a, a recent study pulling together all the available data on a bunch of um, larger top predators, a bunch of sort of middle predators, um, you know, say cod, crab, um, some of the bigger trim flatfish and other fishes. Um, and um, I mean, pulled together data from uh, throughout the Circumpolar North, kind of mostly on the shelf regions where data is available, then build models of species distribution and use that as a basis for kind of counting up how many species were estimated to be in each region um, each each year. Um, and so these are the trends in the number of species. So this is simple species richness for some um, some area. And um, there's uh, uh, it shows a fairly clear increase in both the top predators and these kind of middle predators and all species combined over time. So more species um, entering those areas around the around the Arctic. Um, this shows a map of that where the largest uh, changes have occurred. Uh, the browner colors here are increases in species richness. Um, uh, when you go from higher ice conditions, your conditions cooler, uh, conditions with more ice to less ice. And so you clearly see um, in these inflow shelves here, um, uh, higher uh, increase in species richness of top predators. Um, also to some extent on the shelves here, increase in richness of mesopredators. And this is for all species combined. So the largest changes sort of in the Pacific Arctic um, region extending into the basin. Um, and then we can also look at diversity in a more regional scale. Um, 
uh, for just the Chukchi Sea. And here we just looked at two contrasting year because that's the year where we had good sampling in the Northeast Chukchi Sea here through the Ambon project. Um, and between those two years, he said were a pretty contrasting year in that in 2017, there uh, was uh, the Pacific water flowing in through Bering Street, uh, Bering Strait, uh, extended much further north uh, over the shelf here. So it flooded the entire shelf almost all the way to the to the uh, um, slope there. And that really showed in the biology. And I'm just showing a little excerpt of that here for um, for two groups of species, the demersal fish and zooplankton. Um, and their species richness, richness, if you're not used to these plots, these are um, species accumulation curves. So that's basically shows the number of species that we record as the number of stations increases. So the more stations you sample, the more fish you'll see, but at some point it'll level off because you've sampled everything there is. And I'm just comparing year 2015, which is that uh, fresher, cooler, and more Arctic year in the, on the Chukchi Sea shelf. And contrasting that was 2017, which is just saltier, warmer, and has more Pacific influence because there was a stronger inflow of Pacific water. And so you can see that uh, there was a much higher species um, richness in 2017 associated with those warmer Pacific waters um, in entering the Chukchi Sea. And basically, we saw in 2017, in terms of fish, we saw a number of small demersal species, most, mostly they were not encountered in 2015. And that included some like sculpins, pricklebacks, poachers, greenling, and also pollock. Um, and these, this was on the mostly on the bottom, but the pollock, we also observed that in um, other areas. So um, I'm going to look specifically at a few commercial or species that could be of commercial interest and their potential for kind of colonizing the Chukchi Sea or for that matter, the Central Arctic Ocean. Um, so who's moving into the Chukchi Sea? So uh, walleye pollock definitely was one of them. The juvenile walleye pollock are transported into the Chukchi Sea with Bering Sea waters. Um, in 2012-13, when we were out here sampling, we basically, um, and this, these are surface trolls now, this is in the surface water, so that's looking at juveniles um, that, that live in the, in the water column, not the older ones on the bottom. And so 2013, we see only um, Arctic cod, that's the ones in blue here, and then in red, you'll see um, some Walleye pollock coming in in 2017 kind of spread uh, throughout the area. Um, so they vectored all the way um, uh, to the northeast portion of the, the shelf here in that year. Um, and then in 2019, we saw uh, um, uh, an overwhelming majority of the, the fish caught in the southern part of the Chukchi Sea or uh, actually into the northeast Chukchi Sea were walleye pollock until you get up to that um, kind of Arctic water masses up here. Um, so um, walleye pollock clearly um, uh, entering the Chukchi Sea, what their fate is ultimately, we don't really know. Um, there has been, there have been some uh, older H, H2 plus walleye pollock sampled in the, in the Beaufort Sea around the corner here. So some of them presumably survive, but this may be kind of a, one-way street for most of them, and most of them probably not, not going to make it if it gets down to, to freezing there in the winter. Um, who else is moving? Um, this shows the feeding migration of one adult Pacific cod that was tacked in March of 21, I believe, down at, uh, near Sanak Island here in the Gulf. And it made its way up over uh, March, April, May, June, July, August, in September, um, all the way up off of Point Hope somewhere, and then the, the satellite tag popped off, popped off. So we know it was there at that time, and this is kind of a reconstructed, reconstructed path. This is courtesy of uh, Julie Nielsen. So um, a fish from the Gulf of Alaska moving all the way up into the Chukchi Sea, and um, uh, again, we don't know what what happened to that fish after that, but presumably it might have migrated back or moved back south to, to go spawn. Um, 
Other fish moving into the Chukchi Sea are walleye pollock, and this is from a survey that the Russians conducted in the Western Chukchi Sea in 2019, um, where they found uh, fairly good numbers of both adult pollock and juvenile pollock. Um, and they estimated a total pollock biomass during that summer in the Western Chukchi Sea of 700,000 tons. And they actually decided that's enough to um, uh, have a fishery. So they set a quota for 2021 20, 20, and 22 of 37,000 tons. And then in 2021, at least, the catch was um, over uh, 4,000 tons. Um, sorry, I changed it. I guess I just duplicated the slide. So this, uh, so a bit over 4,000 tons, and I believe in uh, in 2022 and 2023 they caught a, a, a similar amounts or more. Although I don't have the um, the numbers, and they hard to get right now, as you can imagine. Um, and this just shows in 2021 there were a couple boats fishing, um, and this is where they where they were fishing um, for for pollock. And uh, Gay was telling me earlier that you know she always has her eye on these um, AIS data and um, and that they were fishing off of Point Hope here again this year somewhere. Um, what we don't really know is what's the fate of those fish for the juveniles. It may well be a dead end, um, and in that they just uh, are going to die in winter when it gets cold. Um, for the adults, it could just be a summer feeding ground if they can manage to get back in time before things freeze up. Um, um, so presumably there's good food available. They can. Uh, that's probably what that uh, that cod uh, was pursuing when it went all the way from the from the Gulf to the Chukchi Sea. Um, whether or not they can occupy that area year round really depends on what temperatures they encounter. Um, and I'll get back to that. And then you know, ultimately, uh, you know, the, uh, potentially some of these species could establish new spawning areas, but that would um, certainly require the right conditions and warmer temperatures and uh, throughout the year. Um, but is year round occupancy possible? Um, some of you may have seen Seth Danielson's talk at uh, the Alaska Marine Science Symposium in January, where he showed, um, and he also had some older data that showed some similar patterns um, that there, you know, we, I used to believe all the time, and maybe we generally used to believe that when, when the ice forms, the whole water column is going to be just vertically um, mixed and uh, minus 1.8 degrees top to bottom. But um, they saw in a bunch of locations during this November cruise in 2021, um, uh, uh, you know, cold temperatures at the top here, but a warmer bottom layer. Not exactly warm, warm, but you know, almost one degrees, which is pretty warm by winter Chukchi Sea standards. And um, so a, a, a somewhat warmer, higher salinity um, bottom layer uh, with also some, uh, you know, remnants of chlorophyll. In there, presumably being affected there, and they had the hydroacoustics going and saw some sign of fish in that layer as well. Um, you know, could be, could be already caught, could be, could be anything. Um, and um, uh, Seth and others then also, um, you know, try to see uh, what would this like, what would this look like over the winter. Um, uh, with bottom temperatures over the entire Chukchi Sea shelf. Of course, we don't have observations in the winter over the entire Chukchi Sea shelf, but he can uh, run the PARAMS model, which is a, um, an ocean circulation model for that region that can give you bottom temperatures. Um, and um, that's been you know, fairly well validated where we do have observations. It usually tends to um, match the observations fairly well. And so this is basically running that model for a while with uh, atmospheric conditions as they were in 2017 during that relatively warm year with uh, a strong inflow into the um, into the through Bering Strait. And so this shows after four years under those conditions um, in January, um, you know, fairly warm temperatures. Oops, I forgot to put the bar on here, but the yellows are 
you know the the purple is uh, minus 1.8 and everything else is warmer so the yellow is just probably around uh, 0 0 to 1 or so um so um uh certainly in the model here suggesting warmer temperatures into into um january and sort of a warmer corridor of water here presumably inflow from um through uh the Anadir Strait here and then Bering Strait. Um, looking at April, um, you can still still see some remnants, but most of it in the model is, is cooled down and wouldn't be conducive to these uh, more southern fish species um, sticking around there. Um, but uh, you know, Seth suggested um, that it you know it might be possible. Um, to have these uh, warmer bottom layers throughout the winter, which could provide a potential um, refuge for fish to overwinter in some of those areas. Um, so that's um, that's you know kind of uh, what what might have been or what might be going north. Um, I wanted to just talk about a couple of well-known stories as well, just to um, illustrate that, you know, there's there have been a number of ecological surprises in the last number of years due to warming, and uh, we can expect more of those. Um, so that the heat wave that we saw in both the Gulf of Alaska and in the Bering Sea has had some pretty dramatic impacts on fish stocks. Um, that includes the Pacific cod collapse in the Gulf of Alaska around 2016-17. This shows, you know, what's become known as the blob in 2016, much, um, you know, very warm temperatures in the Gulf of Alaska and uh, extending into the Bering Sea um, that uh, essentially led to poor prey conditions for cod. Um, this is just another look at the unusual um, temperatures in terms of the temperature degree days, how many days above a certain temperature um, on an annual basis or for winter only. And they looked at that during the spawning season as well, just to show that um, kind of uh, uh, throughout critical life history stages, there were much elevated temperatures um, that um, that uh, uh, affect the metabolism of cod, um, and it was warmer, they need more food, and prey conditions were poor, and all of that led to a um, crash of the cod population based on the survey estimates here in yellow and model reconstructions, um, a, a massive um, a, a decline in the biomass after that marine heat wave due to, um, whoops, due to the Pacific cod basically dying higher, higher mortality. Uh, both, uh, you know, basically starvation, they so run out of run out of food. At, at least that's the hypothesis. Um, similarly, um, the snow crab collapse in the Bering Sea. Um, this is just again showing that uh, temperature time series and that extremely warm period here in the you know 2016 through 1819 time period. Um, uh, this is just the time series of the ice extent um, also declining in the in those warm years and the the cold pool extent so the cold pool um of the pool of cold water on the on the shelf um that is usually a res refuge for arctic species and keeps the more southern species out um that declined there as well um and in this case that was associated in the bering sea was a uh, was a very dramatic um collapse of the snow crab population after it was at record highs um, in 2018, we saw uh, really, really high abundances of small snow crab, um, which looked really promising for uh, snow crab going forward. And then that population crashed in uh, in 2021. Um, you know, we didn't have any data in 2020. There was no survey. And in 2021, they were pretty much gone. And the story is basically that they um, presumably, uh, because of the warm temperatures, they were crowded into a smaller area. Um, uh, higher metabolism because of the warmer temperatures. They um, needed more food um, and basically ate themselves out of food um, and and uh, starved to death. And that also it might spread disease and there may be other other factors involved. But that's sort of the current hypothesis about what happened. Um, this just shows uh, um, a, a time series of the size composition of those crab, and you can. You don't really have to look at the uh, each year here, but you can see in those um, 
years prior to uh, 2018, 19, there was this buildup of small crab in the population uh, that you can see them kind of growing over time from one year to the next. And then in uh, uh, in 20, uh, 21 here, uh, during the 2021 survey, that there was basically nothing at any size. Um, so massive, massive decline and um, abundance. Um, there are some other unknowns and unknowns. Of course, we've had the salmon run failures for Chinook and Chum in Western Alaska, then uh, associated with that heat wave, the seabird die-offs and poor reproductive success in the Northern Bering Sea. Um, something that's a little less well known is changes in body size um, uh, in that uh, during warmer years, a lot of fish species tend to grow faster when they're young, but they don't reach the same size. So they smaller at, at older ages um, at a given at a given age, they reach a smaller size. Um, and we've seen that for pollock as well as for salmon. Um, and uh, uh, that's been observed along, uh, across a wide variety of species, although not, uh, not all species show that same response. Um, ocean acidification, of course, is another concern that affects shellfish and some of the prey species. And then in a review paper a few years ago, we kind of highlighted the potential for um, surprises or what you might call wild cards or black swans, um, these low probability, high impact events that we should think about in a management context. And at the time we were thinking though, well, maybe harmful, harmful algal blooms is, uh, is uh, uh, you know, one of these low probability events. Of course, we've had harmful algal blooms for a while now in that area. Um, infectious diseases, certainly, and we have some of those in that area as well that have increased uh, perhaps. Um, uh, oil spills is always something to think about and consider um, and prepare for. Um, and then uh, a, a real wild card would be a, a shutdown of the flow through Bering Strait if the pressure difference between uh, the Pacific and the Arctic for some reason were to um, were to uh, go away or reverse. And there, there was like some, uh, a paper at least, that kind of speculated that that could happen, which would dramatically change um, that region uh, because you wouldn't get the through flow through Be north general northward flow through Bering Strait anymore. Um, not something you know that we would expect <laughs> uh, any anytime soon, but I, the this was more of a kind of a thought exercise to say that we really uh, these kinds of surprises usually is what mess up our our management, not so much gradual changes. Um, it's not all gloom and doom, of course. There are some bright spots. Um, uh, there's there has been continued strong sockeye salmon recruitment in uh, to Bristol Bay. The returns to Bristol Bay have been at record highs recently. Um, another um, bright spot is uh, sable fish, and so there have been um, these bars here reflect the estimated number of H2 fish. And, uh, you know, they are really spiky every once in a while, while you get a good year. There weren't any good years for a long time. And then recently there's been a number of really strong year classes. And you can see that in the after a period of decline here, a, a big in, uh, uptick in, um, in the, the biomass. And that will continue because these fish are really still very young and uh, keep growing. Sable fish is a very long lived species. Um, and there were so many young fish actually on the on the Bering Sea shelf and in the Gulf that it led to problems in the fishery in that they, um, you know, the processors don't want small sable fish. They weren't worth anything. And so uh, people um, didn't know what to do with them. They were prohibited from throwing them back by regulation and, um, and they weren't worth anything. So you know, really that's it, despite a good, Situation in terms of increasing biomass of sable fish, um, you know, economically it was kind of a disaster too. Um, anyway, so that's just some some of the changes that we've seen, some of the changes that we might expect, and this is more just some thoughts on management responses as they have happened and 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 might happen. But it's really just um, you know a little overview of some of the some of the things that um, uh, mostly focusing on sort of the federal management context. Um, so what are what are some of the main management issues? Um, clearly, that shift of fish stocks into the northern Bering Sea, that includes some of the commercial species like 
um, pollock, cod, and uh, some flatfish species is something that uh, management is still grappling with. Uh, of course, it has ecosystem impacts in the northern Bering Sea with consequences for seabirds and mammals that are really important in that region. Um, it has a potential to lead to just conflicts between commercial fisheries um, following this northward uh, expansion of these species and um, and the uh, Bering Strait communities that uh, that make a living in that uh, in that area. That's their backyard and their breadbasket. Um, and then also um, uh, there's uh, there's all kinds of transboundary issues. Um, uh, for example, for Pacific cod, this used to be a stock that was pretty much entirely constrained to the eastern Bering, Bering Sea, the U.S. portion of the Bering Sea, and it now has become essentially a transboundary stock. Um, and so some coordination with Russia certainly would be very well advised, and uh, there's not much happening at the moment. Um, and then, um, so that's sort of for the Northern Bering Sea, um, and I'll get back to the Northern Bering Sea in a little bit. I wanted to briefly touch on expansion into the Chukchi Sea. Um, that is currently close to commercial fishing, um, so it's not really a, a concern, and there's limited ongoing monitoring for fish. Um, and then, of course, there's also the expansion into the high Arctic beyond the uh, U.S. EEZ. Um, and as you probably know, there's been a fish, there's a fishery moratorium now for 16 years or 14 years left, maybe. Um, and there's at the moment very limited monitoring in the um, in the high Arctic and the Central Arctic Ocean, um, but uh, some efforts underway to increase our monitoring there. Um, so back to the northern Bering Sea, just a little bit. Um, the um, one of the things that's relevant here in that context um, under under federal management, when the council and I was actually on the SSC way back when, when we first started thinking about sort of climate change impacts and the potential for species to shift north, this northern Bering Sea research area was established um, under Amendment 89. Um, it was implemented in 2008. Um, that amendment um, prohibits um, bottom trawling or what's technically called non-pelagic trawling in this area, um, uh, uh, or bottom trawling would be allowed only in the context of a research plan. Um, so this required, uh, that, that amendment also required the development of a management plan to identify where trawling would be allowed if it is allowed. Uh, and it directed the Alaska Fishery Science Center to design experiments for assessing effects of trawl gear in previously untrawled areas. And you know, the thought here is was, of course, that fisheries might expand northward. There might be interest in um, in bottom trawling in those areas, depending on what fish spread north. And uh, there's potential for um, fisheries in the future, and we should at least understand what the consequences of such a fishery would be um, if it were to occur. Um, and then in um, uh, there were you know a bunch of um, meetings and engagement with northern Bering Sea communities and in response to public testimony from from tribes and the northern Bering Sea communities, the council suspend, uh, suspended the work on the research plan. Um, and uh, and also noted that future development of a research plan um, should only occur after further engagement with stakeholders and community participants. Um, and that's where the council kind of left it at at the time, and it hasn't really taken that up. Um, and of course, you've, um, some of you are probably aware that the Alaska Fishery Science Center has, uh, you know, um, followed up on those original plans and um, uh, has proposed some. Uh, some work to address those issues that were um, identified in that um, in that amendment. Um, it's important to note too that the ground fish in the northern Bering Sea are managed as part of the established eastern Bering Sea ground fish stocks under the what's known as the Bering Sea Aleutian Islands Fishery Management Plan or FMP. Um, so this is not, there's no separate spatial management measures for the Northern Bering Sea. And that's why some of the fisheries, for example, the freezer longliners that target um, Pacific cod have simply followed Pacific cod um, into the Northern Bering Sea. As those of you who live in the area are probably well aware and um, most everybody else as well. 
And um, so that's kind of where things uh, things are um, at at the moment. There's other uh, other relevant laws, and I just um, I mean there's lots of relevant laws, but one other one I wanted to highlight here is the executive order that created the Northern Bering Sea Climate Resilience Area, and and I honestly don't know that much about it, um, but that um, did establish a task force to kind of kind of um, uh, uh, determine what what to do with that area, and that's uh, co-chaired by um, Department of Interior, NOAA, and U.S. Coast Guard. And the language in EO in that executive order provides that it shall be the policy of the United States to enhance the resilience of the Northern Bering Sea region by conserving the region's ecosystem, including those natural resources that provide important cultural and subsistence value and services to the people of the region. Um, so that's kind of the overall guiding um, uh, guiding language in that uh, executive order. Um, and then uh, just briefly, uh, the Chukchi Sea um, that is managed under the Arctic Fishery Management Plan um, that was approved by the Council and implemented by NIMS in 2009. Uh, it uh, closes all federal waters um, uh, north of Bering Strait to commercial fishing. Um, the uh, it's important to know that the Arctic FMP does not regulate the harvest of marine mammals and birds or says anything about subsistence or recreational fishing or state managed fisheries. Um, at, at the time, this was a pretty proactive um, sort of uh, ecosystem based fishery management based or that's that's a redundant EBFM ecosystem based fishery management approach um, using. Uh, using the tools or the the mechanisms that the council had available, and that was the establishment of an FMP. But an FMP actually requires you to identify what are the target species. Um, so after looking at the available data, three target species, potential target species were identified that included Arctic cod, saffron cod, and snow crab. And then um, the you know the best estimates of how many there are and if they could sustain a fishery was done at the time um, and it was determined that the overfishing limit, so the um, the uh, absolute, you know, the limit on what you could harvest uh, in, in a fishery would be set at zero and that's where it's been at. Um, and so to, to change that would uh, re require essentially uh, an amendment to the fishery management plan in case there were interest in a fishery or a potential for a fishery. Um, what's what's kind of interesting is that at the time these three species were identified, snow crab certainly have the potential for maybe in the future supporting a fishery in that area. The snow, there's lots of snow crab up there. They're all very small. Uh, they don't get very large in those colder waters. They mature at a younger age. There are mature females up in this area and there's a, probably a self-reproducing population here. Um, but, um, you know, they're clearly at this point not of commercial um, interest and they well below the the legal size in the Bering Sea and um, well below the what the processors um, can deal with. Um, so really, um, it's not really, uh, so snow crab is a potential interest, but these other two species are, are probably never really going to be of commercial interest in that area. Um, and and it's really other species, southern species that are moving north, like the Pacific cod or walleye pollock, or flatfish that are more likely to become of interest for fishing in that area. Um, and then finally, just a, a couple bullets about the Central Arctic Ocean management. Um, uh, so as you most of you are probably aware there's an agreement to prevent unregulated high seas fisheries in the Central Arctic Ocean that was um, that was um, uh, passed, I guess, or ratified, I think, by the U.S. at least in uh, in June 2021, and it's a multilateral agreement between um, these countries that are listed here. And the main objectives for that agreement are the prevention of unregulated fishing in the high seas portion of the Central Arctic Ocean. And importantly, the facilitation of joint scientific research and monitoring, and there's a group that um, you know gets together on a fairly regular basis to develop kind of a monitoring program for that region. And there's probably you know some separate sort of bottom-up approaches to um, to uh, 
come up with monitoring um, schemes for that region as well. Um, and then um, maybe I'll touch on this really quick. Um, this is, uh, I, I thought I'd um, share these here as well. These are just some recommendations from a workshop that the uh, council, the SSC held um, last Jan January 23. Um, and some sort of high level recommendation out of that workshop were at a um, kind of at a regional level here in Northern Bering Sea and Chukchi Sea to develop a monitoring program focused on understanding those, these process changes that have been occurring in the Northern Bering Sea and trying to quantify carrying capacity and what expectations may that may be for future commercial fisheries. Um, and to also develop recommendations and secure funding for at least a periodic assessment of the Southern Chukchi Sea to monitor sort of changes in that area. Um, importantly, to improve overall science coordination in the region. Um, on the, that's on the science side. And then on the management side, to improve engagement with tribes and communities. And um, this is more dealing with transboundary stocks. Consider mechanisms for incorporating the full spatial distribution of transboundary stocks. So making sure that we account for all the fish, even if they cross the boundary and uh, if they may be caught on the other side of the boundary. Um, and then at a more at a broader scale, some of these are more technical recommendations that I'm going to just skip over. But importantly. Of course, for science and management, we kind of identified a need to increase the dialogue between the, the SSC, which is sort of the science advice body, and the council, which deals with sort of the allocation issues and setting the quotas, um, taking into account any other like socioeconomic consideration um, to have more of a dialogue, dialogue between the two um, on issues that straddle sort of that science policy interface as we see these big changes any change we make has big socioeconomic implications and the SSC currently um, currently can't really uh, um, you know take into account um, uh, you know uh, non-conservation uh, um, relevant considerations like socioeconomic considerations um, and then uh, under the science aspect here, just identifying stocks that will likely do better or worse in a changing environment um, to he help um, kind of fishers build the best fishing portfolio they can. Um, and then the other two here, maybe, uh, well, the uh, third one here under management is improve the use of approaches that explicitly consider risks. The, the council um, currently is not really taking an explicit risk approach to managing fisheries, and that was one of the uh, one of the recommendations from that workshop. And that is really all I have. I went a little longer than I had anticipated, um, but hopefully um, there's enough time for questions. Should you have any, and if you have, have any follow up, just uh, feel free to contact me. All right. Well, thank you, Franz. That was great. So don't ever worry about talking too much in the going too long because you're the only one talking to us about this like this. And so you give us, we're all interested in in your information. So I should have talked so slower, you. but if you didn't catch it, just ask me now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much. And before everyone gets there or while they're getting their questions together, and I know I've got some questions, um, this is the time straight science audience, which is a great audience shows a little love for the speaker because it's never easy to be a speaker and uh, a public speaker. And we just thank you so much for taking the time to give us an opportunity to tune in and, and learn something new, which uh, about what's going on right now and in the, in the, uh, in the waters right outside our window, basically. So um, with that, you did have a comment in the chat. I think it was answered. I think Kathy Kuhn gave it a good shot. And Rick had asked, Chukchi oh, yeah. closed to commercial fishing on the Alaska side, but not Russian, correct? Uh, yes, that is correct. So um, the uh, the Russians, um, you know, don't have an equivalent um, regulation in place to close it. In fact, they did set quotas, as I noted earlier, since I think since about 2020, they've opened up the Western Chukchi Sea to fishing. 
Um, I don't think they've come close to actually catching the quotas that they set. Um, but um, as far as I know, the catch has been around that level that I the quota that I uh, showed for 2021. I think um, around 4,000 tons a year. So to to add to that, Franz, um, I don't know if it's if it's right to do this, but I have a slide that I had made for someone of one of our days of of um, the fishing activity, and I yeah. just I found the right presentation. It's not the one I was looking for that gives more of where they have been, but let me let me just see if I can show that because it might be helpful to everyone's mind. Can you see that? Yes. Okay, so this is just a, a screenshot of what was going on September 10th and uh, last September 10th. And this is the commercial fishing activity. Those are the actual vessels. And those are in the yellow dots. Those are all those vessels where they were located just on September 10th fishing away. And they were oscillating be sort of between that area and along the coast from Uellen to you know, up the up the to the that whole western area to from Uellen all the way or Wayland all the way up to where the yellow dot is on the upper left. And then they would change and not all eight, but some would go and fish right off the border, right in this well, further north, right a little bit north of here. They were very close to the maritime boundary for US and Russia. And um they were fishing at a latitude just south. I would say west southwest of Point Hope. So interesting because it was in that area, Franz, where you showed the was it Pacific Cod? That Pacific Cod that went up and uh, nobody. The, the one Pacific Cod. Well, the, the one tagged Pacific Cod. So, yeah. so that. But, uh, but they had, yeah, they did, they did find pollock up in those regions and those areas. Yeah. So anyway, that. I'll stop sharing, but I just wanted people to see that. It's a good visual. And the red line between Diomede to Wales is for our waters, U.S. waters, you shall not cross if you're a commercial fisherman going after fish that are federally managed. How can we have a commercial fishery in Kotzebue? Because it's a salmon commercial fishery in Kotzebue, and that is state managed, not federally managed. Okay, that's it. I'm stopping. I'm not one of the talkers. Yeah, there was a question. Kathy asked a question in the chat about the sizes that the Russians are targeting, and I don't know the answer. I haven't seen um, the size composition except from the survey. Um, and in the survey, they they found um, uh, adults, which are over about 20, 250 millimeters, 25 centimeters or so. Um, um, although not all of those are 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 adults and then a bunch of juveniles in that area where those boats were um but i i don't know i mean presumably they would be targeting larger fish um for a variety of reasons but um i don't know what the actual size composition was hi charlie charlie's in the he's not in the chat he's live and with his hand up charlie take it away charlie lean you gotta unmute. Unmute and unvideo if you'd like. Yeah, sorry. I uh, had a friend try to call me at the same moment I joined the talk. So, um, uh, early in my career in the early 1980s, the Department of Fishing Game was interested in establishing new fisheries and maximizing commercial fishing. And, and uh, a guy named Keith Palkey was doing his master's thesis on on Capelin in Nome and Norton Sound. And in those days, and back as far as I can remember into the 50s, Capelin were extremely numerous. You know, for about for about one week a year, you could just fill a pickup every night. And and uh, we were considering a commercial fishery. We did we did some exploratory work and tried to enumerate the number of Capelin in the Nome area. And then about the mid eighties, they, they vaporized. They all went north, hmm. very unexpected because they'd been there for decades. And I guess they went up towards Point Hope because I've heard of people in there. Um, anyway, I, 
that, that was the first the first stock in my mind that uh, went north due to climate change that I'm, I was aware of. And, and uh, then more, you know, another decade rolls by and uh, red king crab began to colonize the Kotzebue region. And there's a line between Kivid Low and, and uh, Red Dog Port where, where the king crab kind of uh, concentrate on and red king crab are present there today and there's kind of a black market that nobody talks about. <laughs> that's the other way to fish in the Arctic. Uh, but but that that's an ongoing uh, small scale fishery and a subsistence fishery. So which, which fish, Charlie? Red king crab. Oh red king crab. Never mind. Yeah. And, and I guess I think that they colonized the area from Further, further south here, here no. <clears throat> they're, they're, they seem to be similar. Anyway, but uh, speaking with elders there, they they were unaware of red king crab until uh, until about 1990. Mm -hmm. So, so those are. I was frustrated when in 1996 that moratorium on fisheries was put in place because. I'm worried that when when that is lifted, and I believe it will be someday, that the to, if you want to have a artisanal local fishery, you you have to let the locals come at it slowly, and and if you just throw the doors open once there's a population established, the risk is that big outside boats will come in and take over. So um, it, it's a real a real issue, and I think. Um, how to manage fisheries is perplexing. But anyway, I just wanted to put those two comments out. I, that's not really a question. Thank you. Yeah, no, thanks, Charlie. I really um, appreciate your insights from ice on the ground for decades in that area and, uh, and also your perspective on the on opening a fishery, I mean, I think there is, um, well, a couple things just in response, maybe. Um, the capelin is interesting in that, I mean, we, uh, you know, you can probably get a much better idea of what's going on with capelin from, from shore um, when you have ice on the ground that can uh, see when they, when they come into the spawning areas. Um, and in the, in any of the survey gear, they just not very well represented um but um uh, except the some of the surface trawling efforts and jim murphy talked about that last time a little bit about changes in cable and they just tend to be really highly variable too but they are certainly um uh, they certainly tend to prefer cooler temperatures so i i wouldn't be surprised if they were um you know first to go north um yeah as far as the Fishing, um, you know, opening an area to at least sort of exploratory fishing just to get, um, you know, to have that knowledge. Um, I think that's an interesting idea. That's kind of worth um, contemplating, certainly. Um, you know, the council, after passing that Arctic Fishery Management Plan, I mean, it would be, you know, it would take, you um, a lot to, to to you know open up that area to even exploratory fishing. Although it could always be done under sort of um, of uh, a, an experimental fishing permit. There's other other ways of doing that, but there isn't really, um, as far as I can tell, not really a lot of interest in that. And um, you know certainly not beyond beyond Bering Strait at this point. All right. Thank you, Franz. And Metcalfs, you have your hand up. Go ahead. Thanks, Gay. Um, hey, Franz, this is uh, Bob and Vera. Hey, Bob. Vera. Good, good to see you again. Yeah. So, uh, as you know, there's a lot of consternation about the proposed, um, with the nets, the uh, trawling, uh, I don't know. I guess that's a trawling survey, but it sounds sound like to me it's uh, making a mess and seeing how long it takes to repair itself. And uh, I guess 
I mean, and you know, you, you've already uh, touched on it, but there's a collision of fishing industry and the ecosystem of um, marine mammals that uh, Alaska Native communities rely on. And, uh, you know, to go around, you know, the south side of the island and around the island where it's like super critical habitat for walrus and, you know, uh, I, uh, lots of lots of marine mammals. I guess my question is, is does um, the North Pacific Marine Fisheries Council, do they, is there a limit to are they, do, is there an understanding that there are other uh, species, other activities that aren't fish related and that uh, commercial fishing uh, uh, is not the primary, and in, in my, in our opinion, not, should not be the primary driver for research in the Northern Bering Sea and farther north? Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, yeah, thanks for the question. I mean, I think that's a really good question. I mean, I think the council has certainly has become um, aware of that more so than they than they used to um, be. I mean, I think, uh, the, I mean, the, at the council, they've thought about um, uh, what would happen in sort of a climate change context. And if, if fish were to um, distribute further north for for a long time. I mean, that's why they started thinking about sort of that northern Bering Sea research area and and uh, um, and closing the uh, EEZ north of Bering Strait to fishing through that through that Arctic FMP. Um, and I think um, at the time there was, uh, of course, far less understanding um, or even awareness of the um you know the fundamental importance of that ecosystem to the people that live there and and just not the recognition and i think the council has certainly come a long ways in um in at least recognizing that and figuring out ways of how to deal with that while also operating under federal laws like the Magnuson-Stevens Act and the requirements of the Magnuson-Stevens Act. And, you know, there's the, the guidance in the Magnuson-Stevens Act, or not guidance, but the national standards, you know, have a bunch of requirements um, that, um, that the council is kind of operating under. Um, and, th but those national standards include considerations of uh you know the rest of the ecosystem um how you know the communities in the region and, and community needs so i think um I, I think the council is well aware that this is really tricky territory um and is still finding its way i mean i think i'll probably just leave it at that for now I, and i i don't know where it's gonna go it's just it's it's tricky um you know very uh tr tricky political landscape and it's it's hard to figure out what the right thing to do is i mean the the one of the one of the requirements under the magnus and stevens act is that you do in some sense manage for what the magnus and stevens act counts optimum yield so sort of um, optimizing the benefit to the nation in some ways, and that includes lots and lots and lots of things. Um, that includes, you know, national food security, includes the uh, local food security and the needs of um, uh, different communities that that rely on the ecosystem. It, in, it includes other cool. ecosystem components, and it's just a it's a, a you know a ton of um considerations that go into making the making the decisions and the council is still trying to grapple with or trying to figure out how to navigate that and particularly in this region where things are changing so dramatically and where the council previously didn't have a um you know really a, a big role does that help bob yes Franz. thanks a lot yeah 
appreciate it. I actually it. have a follow up. And Craig Chitlick, I see you on. So hang on one sec. I just wanted to follow up because Bob, the way you worded that made me think. So that's a rare moment for <laughs> me uh, to have the wheels grind. But on this, so would yeah. it help the council, Franz? Because I I know they're all doing the uh, Magnuson Stevens Act, and they've got their own mandatory regulatory thing. But NOAA itself has to also because that optimum sustained yield. Marine mammals have to be managed at optimum sustained yield as well. And they have, uh, and then, and I'm not, this I have no, I'm not expecting an answer, but just as sort of a way to wrap your, wrap your head around it or for the council, not you, but for the council to wrap their head around it. You know, what's different in the North is when you're managing fish to the South of Bering Strait, I'm not saying people don't utilize seabirds and and marine mammals. They absolutely do. But at the at the level that it's going on, once you come up into the northern Bering Sea, I think we're really um, quite different in that regard. The heavy use of comprehensive use of the marine ecosystem. So I wonder if when they're thinking about their fish, the, NOAA also is responsible for the management of seals, sea lions, uh, all the whales. And then there's the seabirds, that's DOI, Department of Interior Fish and Wildlife Service, and walruses, Department of Interior Fish and Wildlife Service. And then what are those populations? What are the wild cards? Because when your wild card thing came up, bing, we had the most toxic bloom of, that had 2022, we had the most massive, persistent, and toxic bloom of uh, catanella of um, Alexandrium catenella, which produces saxitoxin, which can kill you with paralytic shellfish poisoning. And now we have avian influenza, and there is concern because it's gone into marine mammals as close to us as Seattle. Five harbor seals, Puget Sound, have been confirmed dead of uh, avian influenza. And a whole bunch of sea lions, you know, and all this is heading our way from South America. And it's it's sort of global at this point. And luckily, we haven't been hit with it in marine mammals. So with all those wild cards for the marine mammal side of the house, for the seabird side of the house, for the subsistence side of the house, I wonder if there may be just some language lacking or some vision that might be getting at if the NOAA marine mammal po folks had a, had a role to say, well, we've got to be managing at optimum sustained yield too. Maybe that might help broaden everyone's horizons i don't know anyway that's my blurb and i'm sticking to it but it it thank you bob because you sort of that optimum sustained yield there's a whole lot of not just fish but there's federal mandatory obligations by these managers and researchers for an end game for other taxa that are right on top of each other if that helps yeah so well, think, it, it is i mean like you point out it's really it's kind of fragmented and even within yeah. No, uh, there's not as much um, uh, kind of uh, coordination as you would hope between, say, the marine mammal folks and the fisheries folks. Um, and then you have multiple agencies, of course, uh, like you point out for for uh, you know walrus and seabirds and all of that. So yeah. that that it, and that's and that was part of the reason I think. Um, because, you know, you and others brought that up, but that was one of the recommendations out of the, the SSC workshop is to just put a mechanism in place to better coordinate um, across those agencies. And I know we have some mechanisms, for yeah. it, but maybe specifically focused on that region. Because I think people here in the region, I can't speak for anyone in particular other than myself, but I'm, I'm worried about what I eat out of the sea here, right? How much do I take out? <clears throat> and then, but the managers have an obligation to make sure that bearded seals are at optimum sustained yield. And what does it take to make sure that that's happening um, from a from a management perspective that NOAA is really familiar with? Same for walrus have to be maintained at optimum sustained yield. You know, we are kind of secondary users, right? The walrus have to be in good shape. The bearded seal has to be in good shape. Otherwise, it's not going to be a good food, food safety, food security item for for the the people. So anyway, just a thought. Yeah, I don't want to leave Craig hanging there forever. Okay, sorry, Craig. Go ahead. Go ahead, Craig. Thanks for your patience. No problem. I, I'm really loving the 
um, the conversation. And actually, Gabe, you you did bring up quite a few points that I was that I've been kind of stewing on. Uh, get to great presentation, Franz. I love the information. Good to see you again. Um, I I think my main question, you know, this is getting towards the council process pretty quick, even though we were kind of looking at, um, you know, some information about what's happening in the sea there. Um, but specifically on the SOC side of things, um, and to get back to Bob's point and some maybe the ecosystem based approach or, or some definition of that that was talked a little bit about with gay taking this broad view of uh or, or you know like a holistic view um of the ecology and the ecosystem and just kind of what's actually happening out in the ocean uh, or, or coastal areas you know i one of the things that that I'm trying to figure out the most um, is the utilization of indigenous knowledge in the process. And especially um, at the SSC, you know, I think there's been a lot of uh, attention to ensuring that there's consultation and that people can come and provide their public testimony. Uh, but then the actual utilization of what is indigenous knowledge in the agenda making uh, and then deciding on what information is best available information. So thinking about in the EIS, for example, following NEPA, um, you know, do we have folks on the SSC that are uh, qualified to kind of take the holistic indigenous approach um, when we are thinking about what to fund, what to research, what to prioritize, uh, so that we kind of have a balanced view um, on like what is impacting stakeholders and folks in the region instead of just taking this very economic approach about uh, maturity of, of biomass and what's acceptable for the processors. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's a ton of emphasis on, on the uh, optimum yield principles in the national standards, uh, I understand. Um, but there are also a lot of other federal laws and new, you know, new processes in place at the council level, but it's really difficult to utilize that information if we don't have people in the right seats, uh, not only just in the AP, but on the SSC and at the council to actually verify, vet, and completely understand the information that's being presented and shared to make meaningful contributions to move forward. Um, so that, that's, I guess, my, my main question is thinking about um, the SSC uh, and some of the best available information that comes out of that that makes it on the agenda, and then how that transfers to, let's say, NOAA, the regional office, uh, and then maybe the national office, and how, you know, like how do we utilize this information that is mandatory when we don't have anybody in place to actually really fully understand uh, what's being presented? Yeah, th thanks a lot. I mean, there's a, there's a lot in there, and uh, I think um, I'll I'll try to um, kind of respond to uh, a couple specific things. Um, and and maybe the the first one, um, you know, you know, in terms of uh, what Gay said earlier too, and you pointing towards the need for a sort of a more holistic approach, which is also kind of more across all the different parts of the ecosystem that are now managed by a variety of different agencies and stuff. And I, I think uh, one way to phrase that is actually like right now, the, 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 like we are still trying to implement ecosystem-based fisheries management. And really what we need to be thinking about is ecosystem-based management that looks at not just fisheries, but all other, um, you know, other relevant uh, um, uh, sectors or other relevant uh, <clears throat> uh, uses of the ocean, for that matter, and so that's that's one thing. Just so sort of maybe a, a, a move from EBFM to EBM, um, which would involve even more group, you know, a lot more groups, because the council is focused on you know fisheries alone. They get input from other, you know, sort of things that might impact on fisheries, but it's not, it's not, it's far from an ecosystem-based approach at the moment. Um, then, the, then the other main thing you um, you point out is that uh, I think the lack of, um, say, an indigenous scholar on the SSC um, 
and and you know without saying too much about sort of our internal functioning and deliberations but we have um, talked about that and and considered that um and clearly see we see the need for that um um uh, however i think at this point um it it is slightly premature um but i i don't want to dismiss that need at all and i think that is something that's probably going to happen that we'd be looking for expertise specifically in that area um but one of the reasons why it may be somewhat premature is because the council has developed this process for um for uh better making better use of both local and traditional knowledge through the that you, you're probably familiar with the TK, tklk protocol um that really kind of provides a framework for and some resources for finding out what what's been done and and what's known and providing and kind of on ramp for that information into the council process but at the moment um uh, so far that is just a framework that's just been put in place but the you know we get uh, we get public testimony, uh, but we don't get like um, sort of a synthesized version of, uh, you know, traditional knowledge, say, on a particular topic that is presented to the SSC for review. So right now, we're not really doing a review of traditional knowledge yet because uh, even though the framework has just been put in place, we haven't gotten products that come to the SSC for review. Um, but aside from that, I totally agree that that is expertise that is badly needed um, uh, on the on the SSC. Does that does that kind of help? Yeah. No. Thank you, Franz. Um, yeah. I uh i am looking forward to seeing kind of maybe broader implementation and some funding and uh maybe moving beyond just having a framework um but you know i i understand that everything takes time in the process but just continue to being that squeaky wheel yeah actually um, but what, what oh sorry can, can i just follow up on that briefly and uh you can oh, yeah. if you have other questions i'll, I'll get back to you but yeah, the, the, one other thing that I wanted to note is just that the lack of social scientists. I mean, you are probably well aware of that, that, you know, on the agency side um, and, and even in academia and um, and in, in general, uh, in this region in particular, the, the Alaska Fisheries Science Center is like the premier, um, uh, you know, it's co-located with the University of Washington that has a really strong fisheries program. It's one of those the strongest groups of fishery scientists anywhere in the world, but they all on the sort of biological um, uh, side of things. And the, uh, the the Alaska Fishery Science Center doesn't have a lot of social scientists at the moment and doesn't have the capacity to really um, uh, provide uh, or to dig into all the information that could be available to the council um, through, you know, traditional knowledge, local knowledge, and other, other sources. So that's just one other thing I wanted to mention, but I think you may have had a follow-up or another question. Uh, more of you. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll keep it really quick. I know I'm taking up a lot of time here, so just, just thank you. I, I think um, the last little comment is I, I do know, and this is on the state side of things, um, looking back to some of the early days of the subsistence division, um, one of the main reasons, from my understanding, from folks that were involved really early on uh, with, with the subsistence division before it got knocked down to a section, um, when we were, when folks were advocating for their, a subsistence and traditional way of life in the region, it was always done from somebody that had a PhD outside of the region. Uh, so they didn't know how to use and share the information that was gathered. So that term or that coin, anecdotal information, is not a discredit of the information that was provided. 
that was wholly on the individual's inability to understand the information that was provided. So mm -hmm. thinking about the SSC, uh, the advisory, you know, staff, uh, both here at the regional office, at the national office, all the way up to DOC, if we want to get it that far. Um, but there's there's not a, a lack of depth and validity. It's a lack of understanding of implementation. Uh, and it's really difficult to get there if we don't fund anybody. Um, so that, that's just the last. So I, but, but I, I, I love, I love the presentation. Um, I thought it was very informative and I, I apologize for continuing to bring up the, the, the process here. Cause I know that's not what the, the presentation was about. No, thank, thanks a lot for your insights. Always appreciate it. Yeah, don't worry, Craig. We um we're and what we gotta thank, we gotta really thank Franz because he is over his 730 mark. And if he's still willing to answer one or two questions, <laughs> we we are grateful, Franz. Thank you so much. I I have one more question, but it's a sciencey question. Anybody else have anything in the chat or online? Hey, since when do you have to apologize for having a sciencey question? <laughs> yeah, well, that's true. You're the right guy to say that too. So for me, you're, you know, one thing that would really be, I'm always asking this because I, I, but, but that is reduced carrying capacity. So for me, I, kn I knew you were going to knew it because everything's, <laughs> everything is about food up here. Right. And I see our fish, the salmon are getting shorter, less heavy i mean they're getting shorter they're they're not they they're not eating well probably and we have um you know all the great rush of pacific cod and pollock and all those things that we've been sort of having to live with the sea ice has anyone done the back of the napkin on how much sea ice and you, you wouldn't have to go back very far you could just get those rick tomany satellite maps and then find out, all right, how much sea ice algae is produced when the sea ice was of a higher quality, a high, longer duration, and a more southerly extent, getting into even more daylight, maybe even more algae. How much algae was grown on a regular basis prior to this change? Of change? Because all that ice would be very visible. If you knew how much with the latitude and the length of time it was in the water, you could kind of come up with maybe, I don't know, how much algae was it growing? That then is the primary base and it feeds those krill and it, and it feeds the fish and the fish feed the birds and the birds feed the people and the krill feed the bowhead. So if it just looks like overall, regardless of snow crab eating themselves into, into oblivion or salmon getting smaller, just it seems like in the Bering Strait region, we've had two unusual mortality events, one due to malnutrition of three species of seals, seven years, seven consecutive years, starting in 2017, of multi-species seabird die-offs due to, and we got those birds tested, it was not anything but starvation malnutrition if all of that we still have the same number of guests the temperature of the water's going up and down and yeah people i see that i get that but has something really happened in a big sense with the way the ice is so late to form early to break up and it doesn't seem so stable that it would create a good greenhouse environment you know for for maximizing growth of algae I just try to figure out everybody's hungry. How do you make everybody hungry all at once since everyone's eating different things? You must have to not gotten your, you know, supply chain problems. You must not have gotten your delivery of the goods. And now everybody's having to, you know, duke it out a little bit or move. Yeah. But anyway, that's what I would recommend. If somebody on the back of a napkin, somebody smart could figure out how much ice there was. What does it take to grow algae under there? Well, Maybe. there there are models of that. Um, people have tried to do that on an Arctic wide basis, and there's actually a whole bunch of models that have tried to do that. But it's a really tricky thing to capture. Um, I wouldn't do it Arctic wide. 
I wouldn't go pan Arctic or whole Arctic. Well, I would... and that, but that's I think that's that's um, there's a really important context though because it's such an advective system. And I was trying to think about that as you were speaking, and I don't want to I don't want to make this too long. I know it's late, and if people want to sign off. Well, oh, they will if they want, but we're <laughs> so far. You're we've got us. We're captive right now. Yeah. It's good. Well, I mean, I mean, I think interesting. I think in terms of the under ice production, I mean, obviously, if you grow an algae under the ice and then the ice disappeared, it's going to massively change how production is happening. However, I'm not sure that you get to get less production, right? Because the production is ultimately um, limited by the available nutrients. And so, and, and I was trying to think about that in terms of a really advective system. I mean, you have a lot of ice there and the nu the nutrients are advected under that throughout the winter and spring. So it's conceivable that these algae sitting in place can take advantage of a lot of nutrients that are going by that would go somewhere else. And so they can kind of concentrate biomass in the Northern Bering Sea in an advective area, perhaps, I don't know. Yeah. And so that, that, could be a real loss and a real reduction in, in um, you know, sort of uh, production of the overall system, uh, and that would be really interesting to try to model. Actually, I mean, I think I think that would be possible. At the same time, you jack up the temperature so that you get less nutritious zooplankton. Yeah. Yeah, and more temperature for all the cold-blooded things to want to eat. They've got to eat because they're the temperature's warmer. They can't control that. And and Joe put in the chat, wouldn't it be more about quality of algae and temperatures? Yeah, I think the temperature at the same time, we have multiple concurrent problems happening at a really the base of the food chain. And if that gets, in my humble opinion, if that got rocked hard, all these other things would be potentially yeah i mean i still better think explained. there's probably i mean there's a there's a shift in where production goes i'm not sure i mean i don't think production overall is going to decline but it, it may be less um, there may be a less efficient transfer from primary production to your fish and birds and mammals. So if you, you know, have a longer food chain and you lose stuff along the way, um, uh, that that's certainly kind of one of the, one of the problems. Um, but yeah, I, I honestly don't have an answer for you in terms of how that, that, uh, sea ice algae story really works out, but it, 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 rather than a back of the envelope, I would use a computer model. You could you start with a pretty simple model. Yeah, that would probably be better. <laughs> but I mean, I, for me, yeah, it, it's just uh, you sit and think about these things. Charlie, go ahead. And thank you, Joe. He had a this comment in the chat. Wouldn't it be more about quality of algae and temps resulting in poor quality of primary production? Thank you, Joe. Yeah. And I'm not, yeah, that's, that's I'm not Charlie. A but I, you know, after... After 40 years of uh, checking crab bites on the ice and, and working with Lisa Clow at the National Science Foundation and stuff with ice algae, uh, short fast ice that's resonant and stuck in place has multiple layers of algae in it. It's, mm -hmm. it's like a layer cake. And, and the shorter the short fast ice is in residence, the fewer layers of algae it has in it. And so uh, on the old days, when I first started crabbing, there would be six or seven layers of algae. Today, there's one or two. Um, the that stuff melted in place almost until the bitter end, and then would uh, percolate down through the water column onto the bottom. So, I I do think that the the shore fast ice is the is the secret to uh, ice algae and. Ice algae is uh, very um, good food. It's, yeah, it's it's good food, but it and and shore fast ice contains the fresh water that that leaks up in this in the springs from the bottom. When when shore fast ice isn't in place, any weepage that comes out of the ground, fresh water gets swept away. When Shorefast ice is in place. There's this big layer of fresh water 
multiple, you know, 10 feet thick under the ice and along shore. And so when spring breakup occurs, it, it makes the, the whole of Norton Sound an estuary as opposed to a saltwater body. So mm -hmm. it, it has a big effect that way. And, yeah. and the, the ice is a medium. It pumps water up and down through it constantly with the diurnal temperature changes. That's that's how ice algae grows. Yeah, so. yeah and I, I, I could I could see that you know concentrating concentrating biomass because you can you get a continuous re renewal of nutrients um, as the you know as the water may flow by, um, but you you're staying in place and keeping that biomass in place. Or multi-year ice too would be movable and probably preceded from. Yeah. But anyway, all right. Thank you, Charlie. You got any other question there? No, I'm good. Okay. Thanks. All right. Anybody else? We better let Franz go. You better take tomorrow morning off, Franz, and sleep in or something. You've worked extra hard this evening. Good luck with that. <laughs> all right. So we'll let you go. Thank you so much. And if you want to stay on for like two seconds after everybody uh, uh, hops off, the next straight science will be Friday, March 1st, unless we get a different date, but it looks like it will be March 1st. It's going to be Mark Houston, and he's going to be talking about he works on heat pumps for hydroponics in the north. And he has done some of the hydroponic um, containers up in Kotzebue. And so he's going to talk about heat pumps and hydroponics. So very different from tonight, but kind of kind of greenery related. If we're all ending on algae and yeah, hydroponics might be the next thing. So um, with that, we'll say good night and we'll we'll see you all next time. Thank you so much for coming, everybody. Have a good night.